Well, good morning. It's a very special day. Good morning to you as well. Um, it's the Lord's Day, and it's such a privilege when we get to gather together to worship. And as Greg mentioned, it's Mother's Day as well. And my, my heart on this subject is that we should honor and love our mothers 365 days a year because God has called us to do that. Yet emphasizing it once a year means this way they get to not have to cook and all those beautiful things that come with it. So I, I like Mother's Day. And so I want to honor mothers for this high calling that is uh, so critical to family and to society. And as we're watching the breakdown in, in motherhood, so the breakdown of our country. And so we want to give a special thank you uh, for those who labor tirelessly to impact the kingdom of God for the unique blessing that you have been given for this impact upon your children. And so we want to encourage you, don't grow weary uh, in doing good. The world may not applaud you, but God will, will say, well done. This is the calling that he has given to you, and it's beautiful, and I want you to treasure it. On Palm Sunday this year, I preached on Abraham offering up Isaac, and a lot of you said, what in the world is he doing? And I still don't know why for sure. So now on Mother's Day... I'm preaching on the doctrine of election. <clears throat> I really think I'm the only pastor this morning preaching on this, so it could be worse. It could be birth control or something like that, <laughs> but it's, it's election. And so like Palm Sunday, by the end, you're going to say, I think everyone should preach election on Mother's Day. And so that, uh, on the way home, most moms may ask their husbands if they can find a new church, but I am committed to keep doing what we talked about last week. So we are studying, if you'll turn to the book of First Peter, we kind of got stuck in verse 1 as we started looking at these beautiful truths. And the first thing we just parked on is who's writing this epistle. And we studied uh, the man who God had been shepherding and preparing for this high calling to write this epistle on submission to the hand of God, the man who struggled with it greatly. And in God's good work, he would actually go to a cross and be crucified upside down. Last time we were together, we looked at in verse 1 that you are a people now, they're, they're suffering. And he says, I want you to know that you are chosen by God to be aliens in this world. You are to be, God has chosen you to take you out, to be separate and different from this world, what they love, what they desire, how they think, what their hopes are. You are aliens. You don't fit. You don't belong. Your citizenship is in heaven. You are journeying to glory. And so you may not be the choice of this world. They may reject you and they should, but you are the choice of God. And so Peter wants you to know this. And so I want you to hear this. If you don't get that you are loved with an everlasting love, you will spend all of your days using people, trying to get them to love you and trying to earn God's love. You will be paralyzed and in bondage all of your days without this reality. This is the truth that will set you free. You will know the truth and it will make you free and it will make you aliens in this world. And so last week I made a promise that I need to keep. Instead of getting lost in all the nuances of the doctrine of election last week, which are many, I ask that you would just let me show you the beauty of that marriage that we are chosen aliens, that we would just worship and behold the beauty of what God has laid out in these two concepts and worship we did. I got a beautiful response from the saints of God with the beauty that you are a chosen alien. And I told you the next week I would try and explain more the doctrine and in details and maybe some of the difficulties in understanding this truth. And I really wish I hadn't made that promise last week. But a man keeps his word even to his own hurt, even if it's Mother's Day and he didn't remember that when he promised it. <laughs> so your knucklehead pastor is going to pray and he's going to ask God to unpack this doctrine and that it would help make things clearer and not muddier. And that we would see the truth and marvel and be humbled and worship God with all of our days for the fullness and beauty of this gift of salvation. But before we pray, just a couple of things I wanted to say. First, believing in election does not make you a Christian. Believing in Jesus Christ is what makes you a Christian. And so both sides of this doctrine need to hear that. Um, the hell 
will have its share of Calvinists populating it. And so this doctrine is not what saves you by believing it. And I want to make sure that we are clear on that as a church. Secondly, it's not the litmus test of fellowship. It's not whether you're in the body of Christ and whether you're going to receive fellowship and be in this body and and be loved and cared for and shepherded. This is not the litmus test of fellowship. Believing it is not necessary for this elder board to love you and shepherd you to glory. We, we will love you and shepherd you. And, and whether you come to understand this doctrine the way we teach it here at Southside or not, I want you to know you are going to be loved and cared for in the exact same way. And it's the conviction of this church then, this doctrine. It's in our doctrinal statement and we say this is what we teach. Yet we, what we commit to is to teach through God's word line by line and verse by verse to see the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not some hobby horse doctrine that we get out our crowbar and try to make it fit at every turn. If Peter did not say, those who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God, we would be looking at something beautiful for mothers this morning. We'd be looking at the, the high calling for mothers. Or, but since he did, we need to bathe ourselves in it. That Peter thought understanding this truth this morning was the foundation and key for the church to suffer under a deep persecution for the gospel of Jesus Christ that was going to come upon them. So Peter's saying, you need to get this if you are going to suffer and endure what Nero is about to bring upon the church. And so I will quote from one of my heroes of the faith, George Mueller, who started many orphanages in Europe. George Mueller said this, As to the effect which my belief in these doctrines of grace has on me, I'm constrained to state for God's glory that though I am still exceedingly weak and by no means so dead to the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life as I might be and as I ought to be, yet by the grace of God I have walked more closely with him since that period of understanding these truths. My life has not been so variable And I may say that I have lived much more for God than before by understanding the truths of what we're going to look at this morning. And so I believe this truth, rightly understand, will do much for your growth and for your sanctification. Uh, The chief graces of the Christian are humility and love and joy. And I know no doctrine uh, that produces it so beautifully except the cross of Christ, but humility before God and and, and love, that he would love me in this way and a joy that God has set his love upon me. So I would like to go to the throne of grace and ask God's blessing on our time this morning. If you believe this doctrine already, I pray uh, that you will be overwhelmed at this kind of a love because we tend to forget. And if you don't believe it, I just want to ask that you would open up your heart for 45 minutes and ask God, is this true Not do I like it, but is it true? And if it is, let it have its perfect work in your heart. Don't dismiss it because it violates your sense of fairness or uh, what about this or that that you're going to bring up. Just if it's true, and if it is, it has to be beautiful when rightly understood. So God is not on trial this morning. We are, and I want to go before him and pray and ask his blessing for my Mother's Day gift this morning. Father, we come before you, and again, we are finite. And when we start getting into the infinite mind of God, we're lost. And we thank you that you've given us a word that uh, explains you, not exhaustively, but truly. And so we have the inspired word of God to open and learn about our infinite God, to learn about your infinite mercies to your people. Oh, God, I thank you for this word. And I pray now this morning that you will illuminate it. God, that you will teach it to the minds and hearts of your people this morning. I pray if there are any who have come into our midst this morning that don't know Jesus Christ, that you would use this understanding this morning to open their eyes and that they would call and cry upon the name of Christ and be saved even this day. Oh God, we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, this October we're going to Remember, 500 years since Martin Luther nailed his 95 thesis to the door of that Catholic church in Germany. 
and it fanned the flame of what we call the Reformation that swept the whole world. 500 years later, it delivered the church from the dark ages that it found itself in. And I want to show you that at the very heart of this Reformation was really, a, I'm going to call it a theocentric way of looking at the gospel, of looking at it God-centered when we look at salvation versus man-centered. Uh, I just look at it from man's perspective. The Reformation brought us back to looking at it from God's perspective. And so what we are talking about this morning, it's called uh, what theologians would call the doctrines of grace, the doctrines of how God saves sinners. It's been called the five points of Calvinism, um, it's been called a tulip, which was total depravity, man's born in total sin, an unconditional election, an unlimited atonement, an irresistible grace, and a perseverance of the faith is what that tulip stands for. So this morning we're looking at the U, which is called unconditional election. God's people in the New Testament are referred to as elect, chosen, or set apart for God 76 times. The term believers used two times depending on your translation. This is the number one way that believers are referred to in the Bible as God's elect, chosen ones, or called out ones. And so you've got to deal with this word and this theology and what it means. Simple answers to this objection will not work. And so you've got to go into the word of God and wrestle with it to understand it. It's actually a pretty simple concept in isolation. It's the ramifications and how all the other scriptures piece together where it gets trickier. And so what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to attempt to try to help us understand it. So I'm going to begin. I had like 10 pages of notes on just the history of the doctrines of grace. Um, I narrowed them down so much. So later we could, we could look at it. Uh, Rick Hallahan, one of the gentlemen here at the church, wrote a book on it that we have out here. So if there's interest, I'm willing to do a Sunday school on it. So I won't park this morning because I, I want to move for mothers. If you are disappointed as a mother because you, you, you um, I'm sorry, <laughs> moms, this is my Mother's Day present to you, it, <laughs> okay? And if you're, if you're disappointed as a mother um, because you love that, that kind of stuff and you're wishing I'd go through the doctrines of grace and all the history of it, you're, you're probably doing great and you don't need any help. So I guess just one thing then as I will move is that anyone who's ever rose up against what we call the doctrines of grace that I'm going to try to teach this morning throughout church history, uh, just a couple, there was some major points where someone challenged it. And I want you to see how the church of God dealt with it. In the 5th century, a British monk named Pelagius came along and he believed that your ability limits obligation. And what he meant by that then is if God requires you to come and believe and do certain things, you can't have any limits to that. So you're not spiritually dead. You're just maybe sick and the, 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 there's no problem from the fall. It didn't corrupt man. It didn't hurt them. They're kind of neutral. And so he believed then that all you needed was just your will to live a godly life. And so there was what was called a synod where the churches would gather and they looked at it and they said, this is heresy. And so they dismissed it as such. Then in the 17th century, a Dutch theologian named Jacob Arminius introduced a system of salvation um, to the Reformed churches of Holland. And he said that, but he went further and said, no man is affected by sin. There is original sin, and therefore there's, there's a bent to them towards sin because of it. But we, we have not lost the capacity then to do what is good. And God has granted sufficient grace to secure their salvation this grace is distributed in equal measure to everyone to bring all men to repentance and faith. And so those who are smart enough to exercise their free will toward this grace of God are those who will ultimately be saved. And so it, your determination of whether you will be saved or not, the sovereign indicator that would lead it would be your free will. Um, his teachings were gathered into five points that would be presented as acceptable orthodox views. And then the Synod of Dort gathered in November of 1618, and it was a council comprised of delegates from virtually all the Reformed churches in Europe, including the Church of England. And during the six months of this assembly, they refuted the five points of Arminianism. So he had five points. They refuted those five points, which should have never been attributed to Calvin because it was the Synod that did that. And it's these pronouncements of the Synod of Dort, which are commonly understood as the five points of Calvinism, though I don't think they should be attributed to him 
as writing those five points, but it was his view of theology. So, the Reformed view of the doctrines of grace, this is what we hold to here as a church. It starts with Augustine, Augustine. The introduction is that Augustine articulated his theory in the 5th century. Christ and the disciples articulated it even earlier than this, and many have given too much credit to Calvin. The foundational principle of this system is this, the absolute unqualified sovereignty of God, that he is king and he rules over all. He alone reigns supreme over all and nothing occurs on this earth apart from his express will. That's what it means to be a sovereign God. He has decreed all of history from the dropping of a bomb to the sneezing of a child. This God is not dependent upon the five billion, six billion wills in the face of this earth as to which ones will choose to come to him so that he can save them. God is completely sovereign in the act of salvation and will save all that he has decreed to save. The scriptures teach us about sin, that in the creation of man, God made Adam the federal head. He represented all of mankind. When Adam sinned against God, he brought the whole human race into a state now of condemnation and utter sinfulness from the core of our being, from which no man has the capability whatsoever to deliver himself. In Adam, everyone died. And there's no ability within you to fix this problem. And man's will, due to the effects of the imputation of Adam's sin upon us, our will is free only to choose according to our nature. And so we have free will, but we can only choose what we desire. And our desires will only be for sin. We are a slave of sin, Jesus said. You're a due loss to it. You will freely, willfully choose sin. We're enslaved to it. Man's will cannot and will not of itself choose to humble itself and surrender and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is violently opposed to God and would, not be, con- and would be content to wallow in the mire of sin for the rest of eternity. So salvation is out of the totality of this fallen mankind God has sovereignly elected for himself, we began looking at this last week, an unknowable number of individuals unto salvation, while leaving the remainder of men to receive the just recompense of their sin and their rebellion to God. This election had no basis in any foreseen merit of the creature. So he didn't look at you and see how good you were, but it was strictly and entirely in accordance with his will and his good pleasure. Having thus elected certain individuals unto eternal salvation, God sent his son into the world to become a man, to obey all that he had commanded, to suffer and die for his people, thereby making full satisfaction for their sin and bringing an everlasting righteousness, so to render their ultimate salvation absolutely certain. And then the Holy Spirit comes now and he applies that salvation to God's elect people. In time and space, he brings you to repentance and faith. And those who have been chosen will most certainly be brought to faith and repentance and be saved. This has nothing to do with man's will, only God's. And this is what we see in the weeks ahead in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. If you'll look with me, look with me in Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, To those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who are chosen, the elect ones, electos, who are chosen, how? According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, that you may obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. So there is a bunch of history, and I just, all I wanted you to get from that is that the church used to gather together And they would study a teaching, a new teaching that would come up, and they would say, okay, it's heretical or it's not. The church should accept this or it shouldn't. They had synods and assemblies, and it has died off in our age. And because of that, so much heresy has entered into the church in the United States of America. And we don't gather anymore and assess it with the leaders of the church and say, wrong, get rid of it. It's heresy. Now it just comes in, and it's preached from our pulpits every Sunday. So that now the doctrines of grace that I just went over are considered heresy by much of the church in America where for 1,800 years anything contrary to that was thrown out and dismissed as heresy. 
Jacob Arminius, his view fills our land this very morning. And with it, as Luther said, will be a steady decay in the churches in our land. We are in apostasy in our churches in America. The practices that have grown out of this theological stance of Arminianism is it's brought on the very issue of whether Jesus has to be your Lord at salvation. This whole idea of church growth, trying to, to make the church be a place for unbelievers where we, we give them what they want, how they think, and how they feel because we don't understand salvation. We're filling up the visible church with more tares than wheat. We've surrendered the gospel that Luther and the Reformers recovered, and it has done much harm to the church of God. And so we pray that we would recover the gospel in our day and that we would understand it and love it and live it and proclaim it from the housetops. And so we can talk all about history as much as we want, but, but what does God's word say? And so I just wanted you to have that brief overview to see that what I'm going to look at this morning is what the church has accepted for 1,800 years as orthodox theology. And anyone who departed from it, the church would assemble and they called it heresy. So what I preach to you this morning is, is what I believe the scriptures clearly teach and what orthodox Christianity has held to. So if you will look then in verses 1 through 2 with me this morning. That didn't take too long. That was good. <clears throat> Probably made no sense at all, so we will have a class on it if you want to dig in and understand all of those teachings. So you're, you're chosen. Uh, you're chosen. This world hasn't chosen you, but God has chosen you. Listen to Ephesians 1, 4. He chose us in him, Christ. When? Before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons. Romans eleven five. in the same way then, there also has come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. Election is that God chooses whom he will save and he'll bring into an eternal covenant of love and relationship for all of eternity. God singled out certain ones according to his own will. There were elect angels, some fell and some didn't, and there are elect of, from mankind. He chose them. Before he created them, the scriptures tell us that he put his choice on these individuals before even the creation of this universe. And I love what Charles Spurgeon on this point said. He said, I would have had, God would have had to have chosen me before I was born because I'm quite sure he never would have after I was born. <laughs> There's some theological issues with that, but the humor is good. <clears throat> what was the source of his election? And this is what we need to ask this morning. Why did he choose you and not someone else? What, what was the source of God's election? And in 1 Peter 1, 2, he tells us what that is. He says, you're chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. And I, some of you are like, exactly, that's it. God knew before what we would do. He had foresight. And he looked down, I call it the quarter of time view, and he looked down the quarters of time through all of history, and he saw whether you would believe or not the gospel, and he chose us. That keeps us in control of this whole thing. I like that. Feels good. Sounds better. So what this is saying then is that based on God's prior knowledge to our response to the gospel, he predestines those who will say yes. So all that God foreknows then was their faith. Do you see any problems with this view? Oh, thank you. I do too. At first glance, it feels like it fixes the problem in our heart that God is unfair the other way. A lot of people struggle with saying, well, that doesn't seem fair, and yet it really doesn't fix that. Because I, I was just thinking through this. If you were raised in a Christian home, and many of you sitting here were, or if you were raised in a Satanist home where you were just taught to hate God and to be evil and to love the devil, that, that's not fair. That is not fair that one person would get all of this good teaching and about God all of their days to believe, and then this other person never gets any of it, and there's no hope for them at all. That, to me, would be very unfair. And yet election evens the playing field, as we will see this morning. But that other view also adds a hundred problems, not to mention it's not what God has communicated to us in his holy word. And so I want to show you a few problems with that view this morning. 
First, it's what we call eisegesis. Exegesis means to draw out from Scripture its meaning. Eisegesis means to put something into Scripture. And so do you see anything in our text like this? Does it say that he chose us according to the foreknowledge of God the Father as he looked at your faith and repentance in the future and chose you? I'm going to quote Spurgeon again. I love this man. I want to meet him in glory. Where are those words which you have added? Whom he did foreknow to repent, whom he did foreknow to believe and persevere in grace. I do not find them either in the English version or in the Greek. If I could so read them, the passage would certainly be very easy and would be very greatly, it would alter my doctrinal views. But as I do not find those words here, begging your pardon, I do not believe in them. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that election was based upon your, fa- your faith. In fact, it says just the opposite. I want you to hear what happened when Peter's preaching and the Gentiles start believing. It says this in Acts 13, 48. When the Gentiles heard this, the gospel, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. As many as had been appointed to eternal life believed the gospel. Not the ones who believed were appointed to eternal life. Second, what would God see if he looked down the quarters of time? Well, fortunately, the scriptures give us a a place where God did that, and he looked down the quarters of time. And in Genesis 6, 5, it says, the Lord looked out on the earth, and he saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. In the Hebrew, that means that before you could even formulate a thought, it was already bent and twisted and off course. As he looked out, all he saw was evil filling the land. Every thought and intention of the heart was evil continually. That's what he sees when he looks out without him acting on mankind. In Romans 3, 10 through 11, it says, there is none righteous, no, not even one. There are none who seek for God. Ephesians 2.1, you were dead in your trespasses and sin. You come in a spiritual stillborn, you're dead, uh, your will is bent, it's a slave to sin. There's only evil continually. If God were to look out and see who would believe, there would be no one. He would only see spiritual corpses enslaved to sin, exercising their free will to live and try to be God the rest of their days. That is the condition of mankind since the fall. This view that I'm mentioning, it's called prescience. And it's not an explanation then of predestination, but it's actually a denial of it. Destiny is caused by what people do, not what God does is what they say. There is absolutely no predetermining to that. It's God saying this, I predestined that what happened is going to happen. That is not very impressive. I just predestined that what happened is what's going to happen. That's what that view says. And then my biggest problem with the view, besides that it's not scriptural, is what then causes you to differ from anybody else is is you. That you were more pliable, you were smarter, you, you were a better person, a better candidate for the kingdom of God. So what made you differ was you. And that is never going to get us into the gospel of glorifying God for our salvation. I want to look then at the scriptures with you. If you'll open up uh, this word foreknowledge, I want to look at that and then we'll close out. Uh, Webster, to foreknow means to know before. Uh, The Greek word is prognosko, where we get the the word prognosis. And a prognosis is a medical term. I'm going to tell beforehand what is going to happen. But to get the true meaning of the word, we're going to go beyond Webster. And there, there are seven times this word foreknowledge is used in the New Testament. Two times it's knowing beforehand, and they, they deal with man. I'll read you one in Acts 26, 5. Since they have known about me for a long time previously, if they are willing to testify that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion. Five occurrences now are in reference to God, and that's what we're dealing with this morning. So those two with men aren't going to help us. But I want to read all five because I, I want you to see this word is very clear how it's used. God doesn't leave us in the lurches to understand this word. Listen to Romans 8, 29 through 30. Whom he foreknew, he predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. 
that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And whom he predestined, these he called, which was he gave faith to. We'll look at that next week. And whom he called, these he justified. When you believed and had faith, you were declared not guilty. And whom he justified, these he also glorified on that last day of our glorification. Second time in the same book, Romans eleven two, 2. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know that the scripture says in the passage about Elijah how he pleads with God against Israel? The third time is in 1 Peter 1, 2 that we're looking at this morning. He chose us how? According to the foreknowledge of God. The other one is in 1 Peter as well, 1, 20, Jesus Christ. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you to bring about salvation. And the other time is in Acts 2, 23, this man, Peter's preaching, you delivered up by the predetermined plan and the foreknowledge of God. You nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and you put them to death. Foreknowledge in every one of these was not God seeing, or even in that case, it wasn't God seeing who would betray him, but it says it was sovereign determination of who he decreed who would put him to death. So just one statement is all five usages breathe of divine determination, not response. And all of them, God foreknew persons. He foreknew persons. And so this word foreknew then has deep roots in the Old Testament as well under the no group. And the no, it, it means cognition, but it also meant an intimate relationship as well as selection and choice. We studied it a few weeks back in Genesis 4.1. Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. So he, he knew. Here's that intimate relationship the way he knew his wife. In the New Testament, in Luke 1.34, Mary said to the angel, when it says you're going to be pregnant, how shall this be since I have not, gnosko, I have not known a husband? How can I be pregnant? I haven't been intimate with a husband. The usage of this word, it even spill, spilled over to spiritual intimacy as well. In Psalm 1.6, for the Lord knows the ways of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. He knows their, their ways. He's intimate with the way of the righteous. Hosea 13.5, it, it was I who knew you in the wilderness in the land of drought. So he knew, and there's this intimacy and relationship. It's in Matthew 7, 21, many will come on the last day and say, Lord, Lord, uh, didn't we do all these things? And he'll say, away from me, I never knew you. I never had this knowledge of intimacy and oneness and closeness with you, you who practice lawlessness. Listen to John 10. I love this. Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. There, I know them, and they know me, and there's this intimacy of oneness in our, in, in our knowledge. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, there, there it is again. 1 Corinthians 8, 3, but if anyone loves God, he is known by him. And I'll read one more in 2 Timothy two nineteen. Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. Does he not know those who aren't? Knowledge-wise, of course not. He knows those who are his in this intimate, love, close, near, covenantal relationship. It became a synonym to elect or to choose this word. In Jeremiah 1.5, the prophet, before I formed you in the womb, God says, I knew you. Amos 3.2, Israel, you only have I chosen, and the, the word is known, you only have I chosen and known among the families of the earth. Therefore, I'm going to punish your iniquities as a father. I'm going to discipline you. So this, this idea of knowledge, it has the idea of election and choosing and intimacy and knowledge and bringing near. And now this word this morning, it has this little pro preposition on the front of it called pro. And it's just uh, Ephesians 1.4, as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. 2 Timothy 1.9, he saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. All eternity, I've known you and I've set my love on you. So all of that gymnastical stuff that we just did, don't miss then what all these word, this word stuff is preaching. 
if you're a Christian, before the foundation of the world, before you were even born, God knew you, and He set His love upon you, and He put His favor upon you. Of all who would ever live, He knew you. That's why Jeremiah said, the Lord appeared to him from afar saying, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I've drawn you with loving kindness to myself. I've known you. I've loved you with an everlasting love. It's eternal. And because of it, I've drawn you into my hesed, my covenantal love and relationship and kindness. And because in his sovereign grace, he set his love and favor upon you, he then predestined that you would be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, which is guaranteed that God will bring that about in every believer's life. And that is what causes you to differ this morning. Not your free will, but free grace is why you sit here this morning, a humbled believer, lover of Jesus Christ. That's why you're an alien. That's why you don't fit this world. That's why you don't belong because God knew you. He foreknew you. He loved you. He had plan, purpose, reason for your life. It's not you that makes you differ. It's not because you're smarter than Billy Bob or wiser or more intelligent or more pliable that drew the heart of God to you. That is wrong. That turns grace into a wage. And what I love about this if there was nothing in me that drew the heart of God to me, then there can be nothing in me that will draw the heart of God away from me. What can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Nothing created will ever be able to separate you then from this love. Do you know this? Guys, this is what will change your life. This is what is missing from so many in the church today. Do you know the sovereign, amazing love of God? Why did he set his love upon Israel? In Deuteronomy 7, 6, he says, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the other peoples, not because you were this mighty nation. You were, you were the fewest of all the peoples, but because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers because of loving kindness and foreknowledge and setting his love on you, I chose you because you weren't the greatest of nations, and that should be every one of our testimonies. There's not many wise, mighty, or noble that he's chosen. You, I, I'm the least likely candidate that you should have ever chosen should be on every one of our shirts. You should never have picked me. Well, why did God pick you then? Why did he set his love upon you? There's so many people who are more benevolent, they're kinder, they have better morals, they're smarter, they're better speakers. There were not many wise, mighty, or noble. There was nothing in us to turn God's heart to us, only from us. All that I had in me should have turned God's heart from me, but the free grace and mercy of God is that he turned his heart toward me. As the freest thing, I love when Moses said, show me your glory. And it says that the Lord God is compassionate to forgive and show mercy and loving kindness. That the very freedom of God, His very glory, is to show grace to whomever He wants to show grace. He's not bound by us in any way. There's the freeness of God to just be gracious and merciful and forgiving to those who come and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The only explanation that has ever been given for why He chose you is his good pleasure, the kind intention of his will. That should take your breath away. So if we have been called and justified and persevering in grace because in eternity past, God set his love on us to pour out his blessings upon me for all of eternity. He did it when I was a hater. I had no faith. I only had unbelief the opposite of how we choose whom we will love here on this earth. And so now, instead of patting yourself on the back for your free will, I want you to see that it was grace that made you so willing to freely come to Jesus Christ and repent and believe. 
fall on your face and glorify God for his matchless grace, for the great love with which he loved us and his inexpressible mercy. Do you believe this this morning? I'm telling you, we don't believe this enough or we would be so radical and transformed. We see it in a mirror dimly and we need to keep combing these scriptures and praying and saying, shed abroad in my heart the love of God in Christ Jesus. I need to see more of this and comprehend it and get it. You cannot overemphasize what God has done for us. Think of what it costs God that he might bring those whom he set his love upon into glory. It cost him his very own son, and I just want you to adore his mercy this morning. Do you know you are loved like this? An eternal love that is unconditional, that will not turn away from you. And because he loved you, he drew you to himself. He opened your eyes and he gave you faith and he's caused you to love the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you grasped it? And has it grasped you? Until it does, you'll never be an alien. You will never be separate and set apart from this world. You'll spend all your days using people. You'll just use them for your own ends and, and try to get God to love you and feel loved. You, you'll be in slavery all of your days trying to get, get love and be loved. And this message is the love that you've always been looking for. I, I said it last week before the stars were in the heaven and the fishes were in the oceans. I fell in love with you. God didn't fall in love with us. He set his love on us before the foundation of the world. That's the love that every heart is looking for. And this is the love that breaks the bondage of canceled sin. So, amen. 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 Application for mothers. <laughs> this is why this was such a brilliant pick this morning. <laughs> if you don't understand this doctrine, then this love that God has for you, you're going to use your kids to feel loved. Um, you're going to spend all your days trying to be the perfect parent so that you'll get your approval. You'll get, oh, they love me. I feel good now. And if your kid uh, rejects you and goes off, you're going to die. Your life's going to be over because you've made that everything. And so this doctrine can set you free to be the best mother that anyone could ever be, is that I am loved by God infinitely. An eternity passed, and now I'm free to love my children. I'm not going to use them. I'm not going to use them to feel good about myself and make myself feel like somebody. Now I can just love them in truth and grace. And, and if they reject me, I'm accepted by God. I'm all right. I'm going to pour everything into them, but there's something greater than my children, Jesus Christ and his love from all of eternity. I'm set free as a parent if I can behold this truth. And if you don't, you're going to just be shaking and fearful all of your days. I did something wrong to Jimmy, and now he's going to be an idiot. This is freedom this morning to take that and be set free as a mom. Second, the glory then is salvation. Is that the way God imparts this glorious salvation is he uses means. He uses means and one of the sweetest means that he uses is mothers. It's a beautiful means of grace to have a mom who loves Christ and imparts it. In day-to-day -day life, through scriptures, teaching, understanding, modeling it, there, I, I don't think you could have a greater gift, kids, than, than a mom who loves Christ. And I pray that moms would never grow weary, that God uses means to save. Keep that light on. And the other thing I want you to feel this morning in that is there's times where your kids are wayward and... They're really doing bad, and they're hard to the gospel, and they hate it. And you might be a mom in that condition this morning, and you just feel helpless and scared. And the, the doctrine of election evens the playing field, that the, there's no one too far gone from the gospel of God's grace. His arm is not too short to save. And so from a human perspective, you might say, man, they heard the gospel their whole life, and there's, there's no hope for them anymore there, there, is a, there is a God who saves. And so I just want every mom to, to draw hope in a saving God who, who doesn't need anything uh, of our morality and our teachings to save our children. 
And he can snatch them from whatever prodigal hole they're in right now and have them come back and say, life is with the Father, not away from the Father. Draw great hope, parents, in a God who chooses and saves. No kid is beyond that this morning. And then thirdly, um, if you miss your mom, I know there's many in here who have lost moms and have lost children as a mother. And I just want you to know you should miss your moms. They play such a critical role in our lives. Yet the role is they were trying to point us to a deeper and a better love. And I want you to know that that love is yours this morning if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. They were just a picture of this eternal love that you are basking in this morning. And so don't stop at your mom's. Go all the way to what they were pointing to. There's no better way to honor your mother this morning than to to love the Lord Jesus Christ and treasure him above everything else. And lastly, is how do I know if I'm one of God's elect? How do I know if I'm one of God's elect? Bishop Ryle, J.C. Ryle, he said that it it did more to comfort my heart. If I could have looked in the the, uh, history of the, the book of life and saw my name in it, he said, it, brought me, it brings me more comfort to look at the cross of Jesus Christ and assurance and hope than if I could look right into that eternal Lamb's book of life. And so the way I know if I'm elect is that I see there's, there were two thieves that day looking at Jesus, and one thought he was a fool, and the others thought he was the power of God to salvation. And so if I have come to see the glory of the cross of Christ, uh, I have been, that love was set on me before the foundation of the world. So don't spend all your time in election. Don't give me that lie. I don't know if I'm one of God's elect, so I, I'm not going to try. What I do is I look at the cross of Jesus Christ, and it has this wondrous attraction to me. And that is where, where the Prince of Glory died. That's how I know that I have this love that I've been talking about this morning that was set on you before the foundation of the world. So I'm going to close with one last thought, because not everybody here is a mom. Isn't that a great choice for Mother's Day? That's good. Amen, man. I thought of it right after I made the promise. So that's good stuff. And I'm going to close with those who aren't moms. And this is the number one reason why I see the doctrine rejected that I just went over. And it isn't even that that's unfair. I always say, don't don't cry for justice, what's fair, because what, what's fair is if we all are condemned and go to hell forever. As I always use that illustration, if there's 100 people who committed murder and the judge says, you six on the left can go free. And then you say, that's not fair. What did the 94 get? They got the electric chair, that's justice. That's fair. That's what they earned. The other six got mercy. So quit asking for justice and ask for mercy. Okay, hold out an empty hand and just... I just want mercy. I don't want what's fair. God, give me mercy, please. I've got a begging hand. So I don't even think that, that when someone cries, that's unfair, and they give me all their reasons. If, if they'll sit and talk with me, I usually can get to the core reason of why they're struggling. Um, what they usually get to is if this is true, there's nothing I can do to make God save me. I, I walked an aisle. I prayed a prayer, I got baptized, I threw twigs in the fire and sang kumbaya. I did everything that you're supposed to do. Now, this is scary, because what you're telling me is I can't make God save me. And I always like this illustration. You guys probably won't, but it works for me. I want you to picture you, you get in this fight with your dad, and you, you slam the door and you scream at him and you say, I hate you. And I will for the rest of my life. And then a little later, you finally come out of your room and you say, Dad, I've decided to accept your forgiveness. You'd be like, that's stupid. I mean, your dad would laugh at you. That isn't going to deal with the problem. I've decided to accept your forgiveness. How about in your hatred and all of your anger and you were settled in it and you were never going to quit hating your dad and you hear a knock on the door says, I've loved you with an everlasting love. And I've done everything to fix our relationship. Repent and believe. 
And now you cry, Dad, will you forgive me? Will you have mercy on my sinfulness and my rebellion against such love? And now with my little hand held out nothing in it, just completely dependent on the grace of God. That's what I see in the gospel versus I've decided I'm going to accept your forgiveness. I just want to see people again desperate before God saying, be merciful to me, the sinner. Show mercy to me, God. Give me mercy instead of justice. Have mercy, O oh God, on me. And I'm completely dependent, sitting before him. And the only thing that will save me is the freedom of a sovereign God who can dispense grace now upon me. And he's the one who brought me to that place. And he says, anyone who comes to that place, I will give you salvation. And now I come in the right spirit and the right heart. And now you have to ask yourself this morning, and I know why you don't like this. So now you can't just look at a twig in a fire or if you got wet and water, you've got to ask yourself the question in verse 3 that P Peter's about to say is that by his great mercy, he caused us to be born again. It, it brings you to a rough spot. So instead of, was I sincere when I walked that aisle? Was I sincere enough when I prayed that prayer? I'm going to pray that prayer over again. I prayed it like 73 times when I was at a Southern Baptist church. Just kept saying, was I sincere enough? And I just kept wrecking myself, trying to see if I was sincere enough. But now i got to ask the question is, have I been born again? Has God taken a dead sinner and made him alive and changed everything about me to where I love God and love Christ? Have I been made alive from the dead to love the Father and others? Versus, was I sincere enough when I walked that aisle? So what, what are you saying, Pastor? I might not be saved then. Do you want to know that now or when you die? If God has granted faith, you've been born again to a living hope. And you've been raised from the dead and nothing here this morning can explain you but the grace of God. And I don't want you to die holding to a flimsy little prayer that you prayed when you were five unless that prayer saved you. And so this morning, I, I don't want you looking to anything but Jesus Christ and has it caused me to be born again to a living hope. And we will move there in Peter and it makes it really uncomfortable and really tense, but it gets to the real question that has to be asked because God's love causes you to be born again and to be sanctified and to be glorified. His grace works. If you've never truly come then as a bankrupt sinner to Jesus Christ, you, you're holding to a false prayer with no changed life. This morning, I hope you're scared and you're bankrupt and you're like, that thing didn't work because my life hasn't changed one bit. There is nothing that's changed in my life. And to just finally say, all of my will trying to change myself and fix myself won't work. I'm just going to hold out my hands now and say, God, thou and thou alone must save. Cry out to him. He's a savior who loves to save to the uttermost all who draw near to God through him. So if you know this doctrine in your head that I just went over and you can beat every Arminian in an argument and it hasn't produced any humility or hunger for holiness, Hear me this morning, Calvinism cannot save you. Only Jesus Christ can save you. Is it bearing the fruit? Is it bearing that fruit in your life? And I'll close out with just let, we're going to close with Jesus' words and we'll be done. In Matthew 11, Jesus said this, All things have been handed over to me by the Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son wills or desires or wishes to reveal him. No one knows him but me and the Father and the Son, and the only one who's going to know him is if we reveal him to you. You will never know him unless the Son reveals him to you. That's election right there. So what do we do with that now? In his very next verse, come to me. Come to me. 
and the ones who come are the elect. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your souls. Come to Jesus Christ. That's this thing. No one can come to me unless I grant it. Come to me. That's how sovereignty and responsibility work together. Jesus has to reveal him. Come to me, and the only ones who will come are those who are revealed. But all you're to deal with is you're heavy, laden, and weary of trying to get yourself right with God, and you're sitting here going, I'm dying in my sin. I can't clean up. I can't fix it. Oh, there's a remedy in Jesus Christ. Oh, Lamb of God, I come, I come, I come. And we get cleansed and forgiven and washed and saved. And then Jesus in John 6 said, All that the Father gives me, election, shall come to me. So you will come. And the one who comes to me, I will not cast out. What a beautiful promise. He'll never say, you're not one of God's elect, get out of here. Anyone who comes to me, I will receive. So who will come? But those whom the Son reveals himself to And I praise God that he revealed himself to me because I saw a beauty and a glory and I came and I keep coming to him as a living stone again and again and again. That's how I know I've been loved before the foundation of the world, that God would love me in that way. Let that change you, transform you, and break everything loose in your life. Moms, let let that make you the happiest ladies in the world today. (laughs) That's just great news, good news. Rejoice, celebrate a God like this. And... um, Let's keep bringing them to the children. I've got this quote. I'm out of time, but uh, it was Jonathan Edwards and this guy named Max Jukes who lived at the exact same time. And Max Jukes rejected God and Jonathan Edwards believed in God and they traced the lineage of Max Jukes and he had like, it was like 37 people went to prison, 12 prostitutes and went through, he he didn't have anything and he cost the state like $500,000 and keeping all his uh, lineage in prison and all of that. You just look at it and go, that's awful. And then I come over here and Edwards, he, he has like 37 ministers, 16 missionaries, uh, a vice president of the United States. And you look at his lineage and it says his family has cost the state zero in corrections. Do you believe in the doctrine of election? Yes. Does God use means? You better believe it. He uses means. And Max Jukes rejected him. And God sat, took Edwards and he preached it and lived it and proclaimed it. And so I just pray every mother take these means. Be confident. God loves to save. It's his glory. Teach these kids. Preach. And don't ever grow weary. There's always hope no matter where they are, even this morning. There is always hope because of the electing grace of Almighty God. I'm, I'll just keep going. We need to stop. <sighs> Father, we thank you that you would love anyone. God, there was nothing in us. You should have hated us and condemned us forever. We earned it. We deserved it. How would you love us this way? You had us in your heart before you even created this universe. Jesus Christ had us in his heart as he hung on a cross. You'll have us in your heart for all of eternity. And I stand so confident because hell itself can't break me out of this love. God, thank you. This is the love that we've always wanted. And because of it, we're aliens. God, we don't belong. This love has taken our heart away, and we are now yours. And we're going to live different. Lord, we're going to reject uh, the sin of this world and its thinking and its ways. Lord, we want to live as holy as men and women possibly can, this side of glory. And so we pray that this truth of being chosen by the foreknowledge of God would set us free as pilgrims and aliens and sojourners. God, that it would captivate us and overwhelm us and take us, just take us to you. So Lord, bless every mother here this morning. Let them be encouraged again in this beautiful truth. Let them find great hope in parenting. What a beautiful thing that you use means. God, let them never grow weary of the means, never grow tired of pointing to Jesus again and again and again. God, I thank you for that privilege, and I pray for our dear brothers and sisters who have lost children and those who have lost mothers. God, I just pray this morning that you would comfort them in a sweet way with the comfort that we have found in Christ Jesus. Be with them. Encourage their hearts in a love that's eternal this morning. God, dry every eye with that beautiful reality, and I thank you, and I pray if there are any that have walked in here, God, that they would realize they need a Savior. 
and that they would hold out a hand now and, and cry, God, be merciful to me, the sinner, and that you would grant them that saving gospel, that salvation that washes and cleanses them and brings them into your family and into your relationship with you. Oh, God, let them have that this morning. Let them cry to the living God for salvation. Lord, we thank you, and it's in the precious name of Jesus Christ that we do pray. Amen.